This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Well, good morning, and uh, let me add a very warm welcome to that already expressed by Sam and by Jaime. Um, it's wonderful to see everybody here. Thank you all so much for coming, <clears throat> particularly those who have come a long way. And uh, I want to give a special welcome to one of my heroes in global health, who I think has probably come further than anyone else to be with us today, the Honorable Tim Tahani from the beautiful mountain kingdom of Lesotho. Tim, would you stand for a moment? <laughs> Thank you. Some of you may not know Tim, and I just want to introduce him quickly to you and also thank him again for coming so far to be with us. For many years, Tim was a very senior official at the World Bank and was then a long-serving and very successful Minister of Finance for the Kingdom of Lesotho. Um, but for this gathering, most importantly perhaps, uh, Tim Tahani is the architect of what I think is the greatest innovation in healthcare delivery in Africa um, over the past many decades. And those of you who would like to learn more about that, please talk to Tim during today. Thank you for being with us, Tim. <laughs> I'll, I'll save the surprise of what he did for conversations with him. So two pandemics, a, a timely subject. From about 1330 to about 1360, the bubonic plague, or the Black Death, uh, spread throughout China. It traveled the Silk Road through Central Asia. It caused havoc in the Middle East and Eastern Europe. It devastated the towns and cities of Western Europe, and it even decimated the populations of Iceland and Greenland. And it also accelerated the collapse of two empires, including the largest empire that humankind has ever created. Not bad work for one small bacterium. So we are in no way uh, strangers. We Homo sapiens are in no way strangers to pandemics. We have always had them, and we probably always will have them. But this session is called the Age of Pandemics. And why did we choose to call it that? Well, simply put, if you're an ambitious virus or an ambitious bacterium looking for a career in havoc and mayhem, you are much happier being alive today than in the 1300s. <laughs> and there are three reasons for that. Firstly, there are many, many, many more humans to infect. There are many more of us. Back in the 1300s, there were only 400 million of us. And today, there are 7.3 billion of us. Good for pandemics. Secondly, we travel a lot. Back in the 1300s, most of us lived and died in our village, in our valley, in our town and actually didn't travel at all. Today, we make three billion separate air journeys per year. Staggering. That's not three billion people making one air journey. That's actually Jaime and me making 2.9 billion air journeys. <laughs> and the rest of you all making 100 million. But that's, <laughs> that's another discussion. Um, but thirdly, we travel extraordinarily fast. Back in the 1300s, uh, we traveled and pandemics moved uh, at the speed of a person on foot or a person on a horse or a person on a camel or people in rather primitive sailing ships. Today, we can go halfway around the world in 15 hours. Not so long ago, uh, actually when my father was born, not so long ago, the shortest intercontinental journey 
was longer than the longest incubation period of any pandemic infection. And that meant that I could get on the sailing ship asymptomatic and feeling fine. I could embark on my journey, but I would become ill during the journey. I would die and you could throw me overboard and I would not bring my infection to my new destination. A good thing to prevent pandemics. But today, the opposite is true. The longest intercontinental journey is shorter than the shortest incubation period of any pandemic virus or bacterium. And so I can get on the plane in Shanghai, asymptomatic, afebrile, I avoid the fever scanners, I can land at SFO, still asymptomatic, still afebrile, and I can come to a conference at Mission Bay and start to, <laughs> start to infect people. And in fact, it, in fact, just last week, we saw a perfect demonstration of that in the movement of an asymptomatic individual from Liberia to Texas, who has subsequently been diagnosed with Ebola fever. So we see this reality um, manifested on a daily basis. So the age of pandemics, the title of our panel, uh, about which our panelists will inform and entertain us, I want to first say that two viral pandemics have already disrupted our panel. The first is the Islamic State in the Levant, which has prevented one of our panelists, Alexander Downer, the Australian ambassador to the United Kingdom, to be with us. And secondly, Ebola, which has prevented Tony Fauci of the NIH to be with us. They both send their good regards for this meeting um, and are very sorry not to be with us. But all is well because we do have an excellent panel. Larry Brilliant from the Skoll Foundation, Ramanan Lakshminarayan from the Public Health Foundation of India, and Dan Kelly from UCSF. And I'm going to invite each speaker uh, in that order, starting with Larry, and then Ramanan, and then Dan, to speak to us briefly from the podium. We are then going to sit, and I'm going to pose two questions to them. And we'll then throw it open for your comments and your questions and hope to have a lively interaction. So it gives me great pleasure first to call on Dr. Larry Brilliant from the Skoll Foundation. Larry. Richard, thank you very much. And, and can you hear me in the back? And, and thank you for inviting me. Well, we gave you slides up. Uh, I said that five years ago I had the chance to be your commencement speaker and meet all the wonderful, amazing, inspiring graduates. Uh, and I love this place and it's really wonderful to be back. P part of my commencement speech was on the age of pandemics. And in a joking way, I said to the students, if you're searching for a career, here's a growth opportunity. I didn't, I didn't say quite that you will always have pandemics with you, because I don't think we need to always have pandemics with us. I think outbreaks are inevitable, pandemics are optional. And that's really what I'm gonna talk about. Outbreaks are inevitable, pandemics are optional. And that begs the question of what do we do to stop the one from growing into the other? So most of you in global health know that in the last three decades, there have been 30 novel emerging pandemic potential disease. This is where the SARS and the H5N1 and the H7N9 all come from. And these are mostly zoonotic diseases. And unfortunately, I don't know if you read, on Monday, the World Wildlife Fund announced that humans in the last 30 years had killed half of all the wildlife in the world, now, whether it's humans or the census of wildlife in the world is down 50 percent, and there's a lot to talk about and think about and the poignancy of that. But what it doesn't mean is we're now less likely to have a zoonotic disease. We're more likely to have a zoonotic disease because those factors that are decimating the wildlife population put humans and wildlife into closer contact because we eat more of them because we live in their territory. Exactly what Richard said, the factors for pandemics rising have increased. 
But we have today the technology, and particularly here in, in, in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, we have the tools to stop outbreaks from becoming pandemics. And what do we need to do? We need to do four things. One, we need faster detection, because faster detection are mathematically correlated with smaller outbreaks. Two, we need a faster local response, and in here comes the vaccines and the antivirals and containment and social distancing and quarantine and good epidemiology. And we need to have a coordinated regional action so that if the outbreak expands beyond one country or exceeds the ability of one country to contain it, it won't go beyond the region. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then we need to cool the hotspots because there are specific hotspots in the world where we're most likely to get respiratory-borne diseases, GI-borne diseases, blood-borne diseases. We have to cool them. And that's where we have to build public health systems that stand forever and good medical care and increase, as Harvey Feinstein said so beautifully, the social equity that is one of the causes of pandemic. So let, let's look first of all, how important is it that we find these new outbreaks quickly? It's a lot more important than you think. About 15 years ago, it took us 167 days on average to detect the first pandemic potential disease in an outbreak. What's the difference between that and today when it takes us 23 days in the size of the outbreak? And each of these are graphic burdens of disease. We're using measles as an example, but we could use lots of other diseases. The pattern would be different, but the relationship would be the same. The faster we find an outbreak, the smaller that outbreak will be. That is the gating factor. Of course it matters whether you have a vaccine or you don't. Of course it matters how good your response is. But the gating issue is how fast you find it. If you give any one of these pathogens a six-month head start, they're on the way to being a billion. So let's look at, we could talk a little later maybe about some of the reasons we've improved that detection. But I'll just list a few of them because some of them are the changes in WHO's ability to receive reports from the field to the changes in the international health and sanitary regulations. And a lot of them are this improvement in digital disease surveillance systems. And there's a whole list of those systems from HealthMap and ProMed and GFIN, all of whom have played an important role in reducing the time to detection. And then what do we do to contain a outbreak in a region? Well, we have WHO, and, and WHO, we can talk a lot about it, but since I worked with WHO for 10 years in the smallpox eradication, and WHO was the cavalry, and when there was an outbreak, we would go, I just saw, saw Lincoln Chen, Chen, and we were working together in Bangladesh, and we saw that cavalry arrive. WHO is no longer the source of the cavalry. There's no cavalry coming from Geneva. So we need to strengthen what we used to call PCDC, technical cooperation among developing countries, south-south coordination, regional network. And there's a group called CORDS, Coordinating Organizations for Regional Disease Surveillance, which has done just that. There are five amazing organizations, one in the Mekong, unbelievably, one in the Middle East, between Israel, Palestine, Egypt, and Jordan, that meet clandestinely to talk about ways to contain outbreaks that occur in neighboring countries and to share best practices. And I place a lot of hope in cords. And I'll show you, unfortunately, ironically, and I'll end with this poignant slide, that we have created five regional networks, two in Africa, one in South Africa, one in East Africa, none in West Africa, and none in South Asia. That's the first order of business. I believe had we had an effective regional disease surveillance network in West Africa, and some of the poignant stories that Dan's going to talk about today would have a very different tone to them. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, um, Larry, for that great kickoff. And now it's my great pleasure to call on Ramanan Laksinarayan, um, who's flown in all the way from New Delhi, um, to be with us today um, to make his remarks. Ramanan.
Thanks, Richard. Always a little nerve-wracking to follow someone called Brilliant, and then before someone who just returned from Sierra Leone two weeks ago fighting Ebola. So this is the weak part of the program. But it's also truly an honor to, to be here amongst uh, so many friends, colleagues, and most importantly, mentors. And uh, you know, Haile has been a huge inspiration for me personally, and I had the fortunate uh, opportunity to work with him many years ago. And uh, I'm truly impressed that you've managed to get all of these folks in one room in one place, and that's obviously a testament to, uh, to the great work that's happening here at UCSF. So thank you for inviting me. So, um, you know, every couple of years, uh, or every year or so, uh, you know, a journalist from The Economist calls me, and he says, you know, should I really cover drug resistance? It's just evergreen issue. We've been talking about this for years. Why is this really such a big issue? And I'll, I'll do one story a year, but only if you convince me that this is really something that is worth writing about. And in a sense, he's right. This has been a story that has started ever since we had antibiotics, ever since we had the ability to treat bacterial infections, and has sort of been the steady drumbeat that has been going on for quite some time now. But something has changed in a way that in the last year, there has been tremendous momentum towards international action and action at, in, at the country level that I have not seen in many years of working on the issue. So what really has changed? One is that we truly have untreatable infections now. Before, infections were resistant to maybe one or two antibiotics. We had MDR-TB, but MDR-TB certainly could be treated with, with alternative drugs. But we never had a situation when we had something like XDR-TB, where it's virtually impossible to treat someone, like having carbapenem resistant enterobacteria C, where it's very hard, you might have to shut down the NIH uh, medical, uh, the clinical center in order to be able to get rid of a bug. These kinds of changes are being witnessed only now, and I think it has woken up the world to the true possibility that just like those many new diseases that you saw uh, Larry Brilliant present on, that we have the same old diseases come back as new diseases, which is an even more scary possibility, because these are already amongst us, and if we have methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, we don't think of it as a different disease, but in a sense, it is a different disease because it doesn't respond to any of the treatments that we had before. And this change, to a world in which infections are truly untreatable is really what is defining about antibiotic resistance, whether in bacterial infections, whether in, in TB, and certainly in, in malaria as well. And I'll try to give you a bit of a flavor for that. So you might ask, well, if that's truly the case, then where are the bodies? Who's dying of drug-resistant infections? It turns out that about 170,000 people die of multi-drug-resistant TB every year. You probably knew that. About 10% of MDR-TB in the world is XDR, which means it's resistant to the first two drugs, the first-line drugs. It's also resistant to fluoroquinolones and then to one of the injectable antibiotics that's usually used to, to deal with, with MDR. And when you keep in mind that tuberculosis is the single most important curable disease, infectious disease of adults, and we're now losing the ability to, to cure that disease, that makes this a much more challenging issue. So this is no longer, for many people, going to be that curable infectious disease. And when you have XDR-TB and you see uh, case fatality rates exceeding 70% in just a couple of months in, in folks who have XDR-TB, we're entering an entirely different world of tuberculosis. Now, I live in India, which has uh, more than its fair share of tuberculosis. And a lot of MDR-TB, probably a conservative count is about 70,000 incident cases every year, probably a lot more than that. And the sheer inability of a system to be able to afford the drugs and to cope with the problem is captures, in a sense, what is going on in many other countries which lack the health system capacity as well as the ability to afford drugs, but at the same time, for every case of MDR-TB that we are unable to treat today for whatever the constraints might be, we're simply passing the buck to the future to create a much bigger problem that exists today. Now, the other set of, uh, 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 the, the other, the population that bears the brunt of drug resistance is, uh, is neonates. Now, we might not realize it, but a lot of neonatal sepsis is caused by infections that are untreatable. 
Now, uh, we don't have good estimates of the count because no one really counts up drug-resistant infections. But now a number of studies are emerging, at least from India, which shows, show that high rates of resistance in neonates are possibly leading to much worse outcomes. And a conservative estimate might be about 58,000 deaths each year because of sepsis that is untreatable. Again, this is just emerging evidence, but one that shows that perhaps this is not going to be that hidden epidemic anymore, and you're really going to see that the most vulnerable populations are going to show up with, uh, with much worse outcomes. Now, why is this happening? Now, across the board, rising incomes are leading to much greater antibiotic consumption. We published a paper a few months ago which showed that uh, global antibiotic consumption in, in sort of the, you know, the largest countries, 72 largest countries that consume antibiotics, went up about 36% between 2000 and 2011. Of that 36% increase, three quarters of it was just in the BRICS countries. Now, is that a bad thing? Perhaps. Is it a good thing? Certainly, because many people who didn't have access to antibiotics now have access to antibiotics. But it is a bad thing insofar that that increase in antibiotic use, such as in India, which is happening much more in the consumption of carbapenems, a drug that is completely unnecessary for first-line treatment or to be available in retail pharmacies for folks to just buy, uh, is causing anything uh, positive from a public health standpoint. So the improvement in access in antibiotics is something worth celebrating and worth encouraging. But one consequence of that is perhaps also that there's a lot of access to antibiotics that are not quite required to, uh, to serve a public health purpose. The other part of this is that this scale-up in antibiotics uh, driven by rising incomes is also happening against a backdrop in which there is still high rates of infectious disease mortality across many countries in the developing world. If you look at the crude infectious disease mortality rate in the U.S. when antibiotics were introduced in 1941, it was about 200 per 100,000 per year. In India today, today it is about 400 per 100,000. Across Sub-Saharan Africa, it's probably closer to about 500 per 100,000, which means that antibiotics are being used today in countries which have not yet prevented infections through water and sanitation, through hygiene, through public health departments, uh, through uh, improvements in healthcare safety and infection control in hospitals. And we're really using the antibiotics as a first-line weapon to deal with infections rather than to do the mop-up job after we've dealt with it through prevention. And this just means that the scope for seeing greater increase in resistance is, is, is certainly there, and it's, it's, it's a problem that's not going to go away anytime. Now, you also have to think of it in terms of how the developed country views it versus the developing country viewing it. Certainly, resistance is a global problem, and strains that, are, that emerge in one place spread very rapidly to other places. NDM1, again, uh, New Delhi metallo beta lactamase 1, which is a particular strain that uh, is thought to have emerged in either New Delhi or Karachi about three years ago, has spread rapidly and is now in over 100 countries around the world. But the consequences of that are very different for the poorer countries compared to the rich countries. In the rich countries, people will pay for it, but mostly through their wallets. We'll probably end up paying for it here through having to pay more for healthcare. In the poorer countries, people will pay for it with their lives. And there won't be a second shot at getting a drug when these first-line drugs and more affordable drugs fail. Now, although it's a global health issue, uh, the solutions are mostly national because the drivers of antibiotic use are very different in different countries. In China, for instance, when most of hospital revenues are collected uh, through sales of drugs, there's an excessive incentive to sell antibiotics as a way of increasing revenues for hospitals. Uh, similarly, in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, a physician might get a, a kickback from a pharmacy if they prescribe antibiotics that are more expensive. And these uh, essentially are the national actions that need to be undertaken. The last part, which I'll close with, is to say that although conservation is one important aspect, innovation is also important. Uh, we need new drugs. Uh, we certainly don't spend enough money on, in, in, on incentivizing new drug development. But we also don't spend enough money on incentivizing things like diagnostics or, or vaccines, which could prevent the kinds of infections that then need antibiotics to treat. So just to close to say that 
this is as we're entering this era of, of sort of uh, what seems to be re-emerging and emerging infections, uh, if you look at uh, the bulk of where what these infections are, if you look at a paper that was published in Nature on what these uh, emerging and re-emerging infections were really caused by, drug-resistant infections are top of that list, and uh, and it's certainly time for uh, global collective action to try to solve that problem. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ramanan, for putting. Uh, drug resistant, antibiotic resistant bacteria, and also mention of a drug resistant parasite um, on the table is very much a key part of the pandemic landscape. Um, now our last speaker, uh, Dan Kelly from UCSF, um, will talk to us more about Ebola and has agreed to keep on time um, so that we can engage the audience. Dan. Thank you, Dr. Peachum. And first of all, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming out today and also the uh, the different people like Dr. Sepulveda for inviting me uh, to join the panel, such an esteemed panel. I First of all, I just want to make a comment about Dr. Peachum's uh, discussion of people getting off the plane and infecting other people and the fact that I have gotten off a plane, but that's greater than three weeks ago. So with... <laughs> So with an incubation period of uh, 21 days, I don't want anyone to worry about me infecting the crowd here with Ebola. Um, so I think that we have to consider here why this is a growing pandemic, and Dr. Brilliant nailed it. We detected this late. Uh, it was already, Ebola was already in Connick Creek, Guinea by the time we detected the first case. It's been going on for a very long time. And this is the first epidemic in which we have seen such a widespread um, number of affected cities. So those three things have put us in a position where we really detected this late. And as a result, as Dr. Brilliant showed, the area under the curve is quite large. In contrast, to Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, where, where that was a situation. We can look at Senegal and Nigeria and see how we were able to contain those, those outbreaks quite quickly. So the question, the question was, well, what is the root cause of this outbreak and this growing pandemic? And we have to remember that Sierra Leone is coming out of a civil war as is Liberia. They were dealing with a post-conflict situation as early as 2002, 2004 for those respective countries. And as a result, we were looking at a fragile healthcare system that was set up not to be able to respond appropriately. Before Ebola, we didn't have enough doctors in the country to, to in, in fact, respond to this crisis. And now, during Ebola, where People are sidelining themselves, doctors that are dying from Ebola, um, also um, not just Sierra Leoneans, but Americans, everybody's scared. And I'm, I saw last month quite a, quite a vacuum. So it's with that that people tend to ask me, what is an appropriate response to this outbreak? And I want to I throw a number out there. I call it the 70% rule. In the recent MMWR article that was released on September 25th, outlining the 1.4 million infections that might happen if there were no intervention by mid-January, they also say if we were able to get 70% of people in Ebola treatment units, then we can curb this epidemic. That, that number, I believe, is achievable, but right now you have to understand that Liberia is at 18%. We've got a long way to go. And got a lot of challenges, not just at the ETU level, which there's been a lot of emphasis around, excuse me, ETU, Ebola treatment unit, but also just the idea of how can we create a continuum of care? How can we make sure people get from their homes and huts all the way into Ebola treatment units? Right now, we're challenged by the fact that we're looking at Ebola treatment units that are perceived by the community as places people go to die. Even one of my dearest friends, uh, Dr. Madupe Cole, who's Sierra Leonean and was running the isolation ward at Connell's Hospital, when he um, found himself in a situation, poor staffing, going in to draw blood, getting splashed, contaminated, and ultimately infected, he decided to stay at home. And it's because 
that's a, a very natural palliative care response. I don't think that it has anything to do with educational attainment or socioeconomic status, but really we're looking at a situation where there's widespread fear and irrational beliefs, straight to the point that Tom Oppenheimer is writing in editorials in the New York Times that this is an airborne disease, maybe. Enough to, enough to scare Americans not to help with the response. So I believe, though, that with a, a resurrected health system, with, the, with hope and a reason to go to these treatment units, we can change the course of this epidemic. We can stop what we're seeing, needless lives, innocent lives dying. And there needs to be, though, a, a emphasis not just on Ebola treatment units, which we have seen all through the media, but what we haven't seen as much is the idea that we're creating a continuum of care. And that's, that is is a vision that we need to have together. We need to make sure that people are believing that they can go to Ebola treatment units because we're providing outstanding care. We're providing treatments, reasons for them to go. And we know that supportive care, whether it's uh, given in Guinea, Liberia, and, or Sierra Leone, and this was outlined in the New England Journal article this past uh, week or so, we know that supportive care can save lives. That's been observationally observed. I don't think we're going to see any randomized controlled trial on that. We have to believe that that's possible and that we can make sure that people go from their communities where we're engaging them in deep dialogue, that we have an emergency transport system set up. There's isolation wards, diagnostic services, and mostly treatment wards available in a way that we are not engaging in no-touch zones, but really just putting in IVs, providing that kind of one-to-one -one care we would see at Emory or other places in America. And at the end of the day, that we're rebuilding a primary health system so that we can prevent future pandemics. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dan. And uh, I think as everyone knows, and Dan mentioned, Dan is uh, very much engaged on, on the front line of this current uh, Ebola crisis. Um, I'm looking at my friendly timekeeper, um, and I'm going to ask her whether we get our 15 minutes back or do we have to lose our 15 minutes? We can have, we are awarded the 15 minutes. Excellent. Um, so thank you, friendly timekeeper. Um, I'm going to turn to the panel now. Uh, firstly, ask them to make sure they've got their mics turned on um, and throw a question at them for a brief answer. In the commentary about Ebola, and indeed more broadly around pandemics, um, there has been a suggestion that the international architecture, the international structures um, have failed, uh, in part, or others have suggested um, rather abysmally failed. And I wonder what your view on that is. Uh, have international structures failed to do what we uh, expect them to do? Um, and if that's true or partly true, um, what immediate action should we take? What lessons should we learn? Ravanan, do you want to go first? So, uh, I mean, the earliest conventions for international architectures and anything, the sanitary conventions that followed cholera pandemics in the 1850s, were all about health, and these preceded anything we did on torture or exchange of prisoners or anything. Now, we, that was largely focused on quarantining as being the primary uh, locus of action and not really in terms of offering assistance to countries in case they actually had an outbreak. In this particular instance, quarantining at home is an insufficient response, it appears. It seems to have required a much more robust response in the countries where the disease were originating, which is probably requires much more of an enlightened approach to international agreements. And unfortunately, we don't seem to be there yet. Okay, so more to do. Dan, do you want to go next? And then I'll come to Larry. Sure, absolutely. You, you mentioned the late diagnosis, the late recognition of Ebola and what has happened. Yeah, absolutely. And so I just think that the international community has been slow to respond, but the, the, the truth is by the time we recognized the first case, uh, it was already in Conatine and, and Ebola was spread across three countries. So 
we were in an unusual situation where we didn't have surveillance mechanisms set up and the WHO wasn't poised for a response. In fact, after the last um, outbreak or crisis situation WHO was involved in, they, they um, cut the budget to appropriately be able to respond to this one. And what we're seeing on the ground is, is actually decent coordination of care, I want to say, uh, which is difficult for people to see here because before Ebola, there weren't systems to, for there to be kind of national level of organization and make it easy for people to understand what's going on on the ground. We were looking at a decentralized system where much of the coordination of the health system was at the district level. And now with such a, such a, um, a, 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 an outbreak, we have the WHO paired and co-leading the response with the Ministry of Health via an emergency operations center, after which you see a number of task force and working groups that are also co-led by the same groups. And then the CDC, DFID, and a number of different other like multilateral organizations coming in to support with implementers attending these workshops. So I'd like to say that, that the international community also has responded. Uh, I would like to see a greater response, of course. And I think that it's been, it's been cha they've been challenged by the fact that we've never seen anything of this size or portion before. So while 100 million may have been an appropriate response by the UN a, m a month or two ago, now we're talking about a billion. So it's like as, as our response lags, as we grow, as we, as the rate of infections is outstripping the international response, this becomes more costly. Thank you, Dan. So, Larry, what's your take? You, you mentioned the cavalry. Um, First, I want to thank the timekeeper for letting us go into penalty minutes. I hope that doesn't mean penalty kicks. But, um, you know, we've been actively engaged in the reformation of WHO, as many people here are, and we funded the Chatham House to, to do a multi year program with WHO. Uh, to ask some pretty hard questions. Um, I think the, uh, when, you, when you say international response, it begins with WHO. So let's look right at the structure of WHO. Um, and let's look a little bit at the history. First of all, the structure is not the structure that you would create if you were starting in Silicon Valley with a white sheet of paper and saying, what does a startup look like? Um, it has uh, been built around some um, extraordinarily difficult obstacles. It has a regional structure where the most of the money and most of the power is in the regions. And the regions are political regions. So India and Pakistan are in different regions. North and South Korea are in different regions. Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and Egypt are in three different regions, which effectively means if there's a bug in one of them that's on its way or has already gone to a second, in the case of India, they've got to go wherever it is in India to Delhi, which is the Southeast Asia regional office. It's got to go to Geneva. That's got to come back to another regional office and go to Pakistan. And it, and it gets worse elsewhere. So it's not a structure that you would design if you knew that viruses cannot read border signs and don't have visas. <laughs> so that's one of the problems. The other problem, I think, is that... Uh, I think someone earlier said uh, that uh, the articulation of health for all in its many different forms uh, is an aspiration. It's not a measurable goal. And between the vacillation that WHO has gone through and the world, us, the academics have gone through, between vertical programs, tuberculosis and smallpox and malaria and polio, which were inevitably felt as higher priorities by the developed countries than the developed between vertical programs and horizontal health for all, primary care workers, shelters, all of those romances that we've had. WHO has been torn and one time almost declined a uh, Nobel Prize for smallpox eradication out of a case of acute embarrassment that they had done such a vertical program. Also, because WHO in the minds of many third world countries represented a kind of neocolonial past, WHO has not been as welcome. If the cavalry, you got to have horses, you got to have you know, cowboys, you got to be invited in. And WHO was frequently 
not invited in and has gone away from the ground game into becoming more of a policy organization. To the extent that the New York Times slammed WHO in an editorial saying WHO's facile response that it is only a technical advisory organization and therefore not responsible for the problems with the international community's Ebola response are um, inexcusable. I, I think they actually sort of are understandable, though, because that's been the history of WHO. So it's time we rethink all of that. Let's kill Ebola first, and then let's rethink all of it. That's really good advice. Um, we're going to move in just a moment to uh, comments and questions from the floor. And I see two standing mics. Are they going to row or are they going to stand? They're going to stand. So they are where I'm pointing. And anyone who wants to make a comment or a question to the panel, and please do, um, can you just come to the mic and be ready? Uh, and then I will call on you. And maybe we'll get started right away. Yes, sir. Uh, Dan, this question is for you, for Sierra Leone in West Africa. Um, since a lot of the tropical, since Ebola mimics a lot of the tropical diseases that you would be seeing uh, in that area, can you uh, tell us a little bit about diagnostic testing in terms of the PCR and the ELISA? And how is that working? My understanding that you have to be infected for at least three days before that test turns positive. Can you share your, your thoughts about that? Okay, yeah. so diagnostic testing for Ebola. Dan, do you want to do that one quickly? Absolutely. Uh, so you sound very well read. Uh, it's true that that the PCR test for Ebola can be falsely negative within the first three days. So it's, it's, it's indeed written into the MSF guidelines that that if you have clinical suspicion or a suspected case, be it be a fever plus three symptoms, et cetera, et cetera, that you want to send out a, a test as soon as possible. And there, right now, there are four diagnostic centers in Sierra Leone: one in Kailang, uh, Panama in Laka, out in the outskirts of Freetown, as well as another on the outskirts of Freetown. And if that result comes back positive, and despite empirical therapy with antimalarials and antibiotics, uh, your suspicion continues to be that the patient has Ebola, there, there is uh, written to the guidelines that you should repeat the test, absolutely, because uh, the sensitivity of it is not quite as high as the specificity, and it takes time for the viremia to uh, replicate and grow. There, just a last comment. Right now, there has been a lot of buzz about point of care the um, tests and devices, and I, I think that uh, well, you should know that none of them are available in country yet. They're mostly under investigation by big pharma and such. So we're still looking at needing laboratory teams and uh, your old-fashioned PCR machines to diagnose Ebola. Well, thank you, Dan. If I can slightly generalize that answer and say, I think there's no doubt that further development of highly sensitive, highly specific, field-friendly diagnostics across a range of pandemic viruses and bacteria is a huge priority for the research, for the research community. Um, <clears throat> over to this mic here, and can I ask you to speak right into the mic so we can be sure to hear up on the platform? I will. Thank you very much. Uh, Keith Martin from the Consortium of Universities for Global Health, and thank you very much for your presentations. We know actually how to address this particular outbreak. We're missing, I think, a big part of the picture in introducing the public health primary care and indeed access to essential surgeries that will be spoken about later on. You need to be able to have a political structure underneath that to execute. In the countries we're talking about, conflict, corruption, and a lack of capacity devastates the ability of these countries to execute what we're talking about needs to happen, not only for those patients who are suffering from Ebola, but the thousands of patients who are not receiving the care they need now for their ongoing acute and chronic diseases. Can you share with us how you suggest addressing the political challenges within these countries that are, if they're at the least, they are sovereign entities? How do you work with them to be able to build up their own primary care, public health, and public service infrastructure needed to be able to implement what's needed. 
Thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Maybe Larry, you could start us off on that. You know, I, I've been extremely uh, impressed by the regional cooperation model, as I said earlier. Uh, part of it is, uh, it, let's take an example of the Mekong area uh, surveillance system, where between Laos and China, you have very different degrees of advanced development. But as Laos tries to solve the same problem that China has to solve with a much, uh, much smaller budget, and under much more difficult economic conditions. It can look at what China has done, it can look at what Thailand has done in Cambodia, and you would be surprised that countries that have different languages, different religions, and may not historically have always gotten along, when the issue is health, and the issue is public health, uh, they do a remarkable, in our experience so far, they do a remarkable job of helping each other far more than an organization or a group of people very, very far away. So I, I really, I like the idea of uh, best practices and innovations that can easily be distributed across regions through a regional governance structure. There's a lot more that we need, but that's that's one way to take an innovation that begins in Silicon Valley and uh, bring it out to 28 countries the next day. That's the kind of thing that, that, that I like. Yeah. Let me come over here, please. Hi, my name is Jane Houston, and I actually work for HealthMap, who's been doing a lot of Ebola tracking, and Dr. Brilliant mentioned in his talk. Um, my question is actually about more about the messaging around something like a pandemic, which seems really scary to the public, um, and the problem of a lot of misinformation that I think leads to public panic. Um, as an example, just on my way here today on the Muni, there was a man kind of ranting about Ebola is the deadliest disease known to man. It kills 96% of people. You die in two to three days, and now they've brought it here. Um, fortunately, people weren't really paying close and, attention. And did he say it was Obama's fault? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that was probably his next, his next step. Um, but so my question is, how do we as public health professionals kind of combat that misinformation and try to quell that panic? So responsible messaging. Ramana, do you want to have a go at that? You know, uh, when Gujarat had what was thought to be a plague outbreak uh, in the aftermath of an earthquake of now about 20 years ago, uh, the response to a general public announcement that there might be the plague was an emptying out of Surat. Or, so to ensuring that if there had been a plague, this would now be widely and equitably distributed all across India. So this, this whole idea of messaging around pandemics is an important one and, and should certainly be more of a science than it is right now, which is a much more of a seat of the pants activity. Uh, in response to Ebola, for instance, in India, uh, you know, I don't know what would happen if the first person came into uh, New Delhi with Ebola. Uh, there's three people uh, taking on forms with uh, scrolled out, you know, misinformation at the airport, and that's about it. That is the extent of of the response. So I, I think what you're pointing to is a is a much broader problem, which also points to you know the, the ability to learn from neighbors, regional action, etc., which is also on managing the information around a pandemic, setting reasonable expectations, and also setting expectations that the government has it under control if it were to happen, because in the absence of that reassuring message before the first case is detected, it's certainly impossible to give that message after that case has entered the country. Can we come over here, please? Yes, yes. my, my name is uh, uh, Fikre Gurma. I'm an emergency physician I'm from McMaster University in Canada. I'm also the vice president of the Ethiopian North American uh, Physicians Health Association. Um, I, I want to perhaps make a brief comment. Uh, I, uh, I'm glad to be here and I've enjoyed the discussion. My uh, question is in the issue of the ethics of the conversation we're having. And I want to perhaps ask, pose a question. What have we learned from Ebola 2? I know a couple of years we had Ebola 1. Uh, it was on a small scale. And the question I have is, is the quality of conversation we're having about healthcare resilience, about ethics, about the human dimension of this disease being addressed now that we have Ebola too? Right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to, with regret, take that as the last question or comment. Um, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists to both respond to the question briefly 
but also to make one wrap-up comment, um, a headline that you would like to leave with the audience. Um, let's start with you, Dan, if you can. Thanks, Dr. Peterson. Well, uh, let's see here. So, with regards to ethics, I don't, I personally don't see the question so much as an ethical one as much as a question of how we can create hope. I see the science of Ebola right now more as social medicine and just helping people get into treatment centers and us to that number 70% I mentioned. My last comment is just that uh, we have not talked about the greater impact of this Ebola crisis. I wanted to make uh, make a comment that Ebola kills health systems and I believe that community health work restores life. So what that means when I arrived in Sierra Leone within two days of the year was a four-year-old boy. He passed through the screening process negative, uh, exposed a number of different doctors, nurses to Ebola and created fear within the rest of the hospital. They quickly closed down. That was a tertiary care children's hospital, the only one in Freetown. It served 1.5 million people. And we know that a child dies of malaria every nine seconds. And then at the same time, we, our organization, I've been working in Sierra Leone for the past eight years. Uh, our organization, Well Body Alliance, was running a community-based HIV treatment program. The rest of the clinics were, were closed. The only people getting medicines were those who could receive their antiretrovirals via a community health worker mechanism. So for everybody that cares about TB, HIV, malaria, these other incredibly destructive infectious diseases, I think we need to consider the, that even a small number of Ebola cases can have a widespread impact and collapse the whole healthcare system. Well, thank you, John. Ramana, would you like to go next? Uh, sure. Um, I know Ebola is on our mind right now because it is there and there's a certain amount of fear factor associated with it. But think about Ebola as really just uh, running a film at fast speed of another film that we probably see, whether it's drug resistance, whether it's tuberculosis, you know, a whole range of other diseases which are which have the same sort of storyline, perhaps in a slightly more stretched out sort of a fashion. And Ebola helps focus the mind on the fact that our global architectures for dealing with international movement of infectious diseases are simply inadequate. Simply reporting from countries having quarantine systems are not going to solve the problem. It's going to take a far more robust response that I think we saw eventually in the case of HIV AIDS after you know much dithering and you know, thanks a lot to the Global Fund, for instance. Uh, but where is the Global Fund? That should have been there for Ebola. Right. And perhaps now is the time to think about this beyond HIV, TB, and malaria to think about uh, an actual financing mechanism that's able to head off drug resistance in malaria. Uh, you know, certainly all of the threats that, you know, uh, that, that Larry put up, uh, you know, the, the, the pictures on. And that's going to require the same kind of commitment and funding and action as we've seen for the big disease. Thank you, Ramana. That's, that's a wonderful point. Thank you, Richard, for a wonderful panel. Thank you for inviting me. Don't give up hope. We will win. And, and I say that as someone who worked for WHO for 10 years. I worked in the smallpox eradication program. I saw the last case of variola major in the world, in nature. And when that little girl, Rahima Banu, coughed, and the viruses of variola landed on the Bangladeshi soil, it ended a chain unbroken of transmission that went back to Pharaoh Ramses the Great. 500 million people died of smallpox in the 20th century. I worked in the polio program. I was in Lucknow. I saw some of the very last cases of polio in India. India has conquered polio. We have a little more work to do. Pakistan and Canada. These are impossible dreams when you sit out and say you'll conquer those diseases. Now, you may quickly say, well, they had a vaccine. Yeah, but nothing. Ebola, Ebola is a, a, a kindergarten uh, transmitter in very small time. But we had to do amazing things, and there is an incubation period for diseases, 
and there's an incubation period for response. And what I see all around us, I see a gathering of the Bowler family to root out Ebola in West Africa and to stop it. And I am more optimistic that we will do that now than I have been certainly for the last year. And we will do this thing. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. And uh, I love that inspiring final note and the remember smallpox message, because many people said it was impossible, but Larry and others uh, did it. Um, so to wrap up, um, we live in, in a historical window, which will close, um, of maximum risk. There are 7.3 billion of us on the planet. We do travel very frequently and very fast, but we have not yet, as we've heard from the panel and from the audience, we have not yet built the international collaborative mechanisms to allow the adequate response to pandemics, including the newly proposed Global Fund for Pandemics. Thank you, Ramana. And we have not yet strengthened the healthcare systems of the poorest countries to a point where they are able to respond effectively to the next major threat. And we have not yet developed the 21st century technologies, the new and better drugs, the new and better vaccines, the new and better diagnostics, and the IT systems that will allow us to detect quickly, to contain where possible, and to control pandemics. And this is clearly a task to which UCSF and our colleagues in the Bay Area will make a huge contribution. I want to thank you all for your participation in this session, and I want to particularly thank Dan and Ramanan and Larry, our three panelists. Thank you so much.